So hi, hi everyone, I'm Bhante Sujata and welcome to season three of Dharma Threads. We've been doing this uh, for a few years now and each year we try to do something a little bit different. The first year we did a, uh, a series on the uh, Samaditi Sutta, second year we had some conversations on the Terigata and for this year we've decided to have a few different conversations with people from different backgrounds and different community members just to get an idea and to explore some uh, concepts and practices in terms of how we're understanding, integrating and applying our spirituality in a modern age. I guess it's a modern age. Anyway, so for today, uh, we are very uh, delighted to welcome Haley Kosa to join us, a member of our local community who we met a few weeks ago at an iftar dinner that we were very kindly invited to by our local Islamic community. Unfortunately, the only problem was that as monks, we can't eat in the evening, so we could merely celebrate... <laughs> <laughs> Along with everybody. We thought you didn't like the food, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Our rule is we can't eat in the evening, so no. But uh, we we uh, we drank our orange juice and celebrated with the community. <laughs> it was lovely so. how you actually explained that because there were quite a few of you, and it did catch my attention that mm. you weren't eating, mm. and I was wondering if there was something maybe wrong with the preparation or mm. and. Uh, and then you apologised, and I thought that was so beautiful. You didn't have to apologise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was nice, and it's really to me, it's really lovely to see you know just these uh, the, the the warmth and the, the harmony and so on in the community. Yeah, yeah, that evening was beautiful. It was so organic and natural, and right. we weren't. No one was trying hard to right. explain themselves. It was just a beautiful conversation, right. and I really welcome the idea of having more of these. Yeah. Uh, in the future, yeah. because th I think that's the best way we can communicate, really, to just get together naturally. And, exactly. You know, food is always good. We just have to be mindful of the time, maybe, <laughs> next time. Well, it, I mean, it's it's kind of um, creates opportunities, right? Because then you have to be creative about it. Yes. Uh, find some way of doing it. It was also, I mean, to me, it was also interesting to see, like, that, that whole event was, I mean, it's in a... You know, Western Sydney suburb, northwestern Sydney suburb, and and just in like a, a, a warehouse or yes. industrial thing, right? <laughs> it was amazing how they use this space. Well, right. talk about creativity. Yeah, I was actually quite surprised when I got there because it was a new new place, and I thought, am I somewhere? In, am I in the wrong place? And then when yeah. I just kept on walking and seeing other people who look like they could be of Muslim background. Right. I thought, oh, that's just quite... Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, very original use of space and and goes to show you don't really need a temple or a mosque together. And I right. really loved how you also use that community centre in Harris Park. Right, yeah. Uh, you, know, to, you know, space is really important and those conversations can yeah. happen. Yeah. Anyway... Yeah, I mean, we have this idea of uh, religious or spiritual events. You know, we have temples and mosques and things like that. And of course, the, the you know the architecture and artwork and so on of that is a, a sort of a great part of religious traditions. But also, you know, you know, I remember that it didn't really start that way. Right? I mean, for the the Buddha was often just sitting under a tree and sort of walking along and and you know just teaching people where they were staying in caves or secluded places yeah. and you know it's only over time that we start to build you know settled monasteries and uh, these big kind of monuments and things but it's you know and those things they, they play a role but it's not really the heart of what we're about yeah exactly um, I think we are we have a similar idea that the whole of earth uh, is actually our worship ground and I think a lot of my spiritual feelings definitely happen in nature right. as opposed to the mosque maybe right. where there's sometimes you can be distracted <laughs> with right. what other people are doing or saying or, right. yeah. or, or even the artworks themselves. Yeah. Of course, like you said, they do have a place and they are beautiful models of right. what right. civilizations can achieve and, right. and create. But I, I think the simple outdoors, nature, mm -hmm. and even Prophet Muhammad, when he received the revelation, he was actually sitting in a cave. Right? Yes. In, in the hills. Yeah, yeah like in, in a very secluded um, yeah. cave. And, and he had been feeling 
a, bit, a little bit uncertain about right. certain things, and right. he would often go there to contemplate and meditate. And yeah. do, we, do, do we know, like, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm aware of that story, the Prophet Muhammad would go to the cave and then receive the revelation. Do, you know, do we know, like, what he actually did when he went to the cave? Did he, like, sit there and did he pray or did, what was he actually doing when he went to the cave? I believe like? because the prayer that we do today came afterwards, after prophethood. So we believe that he was sitting down and, okay. and contemplating. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and 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 would he have had like a shrine or some kind of religious no, thing there? No, 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 nothing like that. Nothing, just okay. himself and his thoughts and his worries for the community. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's a lot that he often carried, even before he became a prophet. He right. was known as the trusted one, so often right. people would talk to him about their problems, and he would be the peacemaker right. of disputes. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so there's something very powerful about that idea of just like withdrawing from uh, the structures and withdrawing from the artifice and going to and going into nature. I, mean, I was just on my on the way here, you know, on the train. I was just looking out of the window, and you see, it's a you know, it's a bit of a unusually rainy day for Sydney. And I'm just looking at the, the, the all of the graffiti and the broken down iron sheds and concrete and ugly buildings you can see from the train tracks. And I'm thinking, you know, we really came here and stuffed this place up big time <laughs> and made such a mess. And and yet nature is coming and just giving her giving us her rain anyway. Yes. <laughs> and she's so forgiving, you know. And there's sunshine and there's rain. I was so grateful that fact that. We can actually, it still, it still comes down. Yeah. yeah, there's that interesting irony between uh, development and civilization, and how we are now in our structures as well, trying to go back to the more traditional ways of even design. How, for example, in it caught my eye in central, a lot of those new residential places actually yeah. have rooftop gardens and. Right. Um, they've got all these plants hanging from windows and right. it, it just looks like a green building. Yeah. And yeah. Rassil Town Centre, which isn't very far from me, okay. they've tr even though it's a new shopping complex, they've tried to design it in a way that is more like the traditional town centres where uh, the shops are not in a th you know, right. three, four storey building, right. but yeah. they're actually, uh, you can walk it's a bit and there's organic, green. Right. <laughs> they've right. made sure there are enough trees. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some lessons that we need to learn. It's right? It's nice to know that we are, you know, we have been going uh, in a particular way. I don't know if you know that. I'm sure you know that Cat Stevens song. Song, you know, how much more are you going to build <laughs> until there's no more room up there? So it's yeah. good that we are realizing that. Oh, maybe we need to look at the ways, uh, the traditional ways. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but I, I think there's an, another interesting <clears throat> point about spirituality from an Islamic perspective is yes you should from time to time go out to nature and maybe go to the cave and okay. meditate but a more spiritual person actually should know how to carry that in their heart so for example um, you one of the um, scholars that I admire a lot is um, Imam Shazali and he says that you hold so, the so he, Imam Shazali Imam Shazali okay you hold the world in your hand, okay. but not in your heart, um, and that you go about your business right. doing what you are meant to be doing, whatever you think right. your mission could be, um, and mingling with people, because uh, our prophet also said that the best of you mm. um, are the ones who are most useful to others. Uh, so there, there is, I think, you know, it's important to know that balance. And I know for sure many times in my life I have often, especially the times that I thought that the spiritual path is just one way about right. it. Right, yeah. I, I, would, I would often say, why can't I just go to a cave somewhere or even like that monasteries? Oh, my God, there are these beautiful <laughs> pictures of monasteries. Right. Uh, ashrams. I would just say I want to go to... A very secluded place. I would be so religious and so spiritual without all these <laughs> temptations and right. people annoying me because you know anger, temptation. 
you. They, I, I was thinking, will they actually stop you? And I was very lucky to meet a teacher who said, ah, oh, you know, that anyone can do it that way, Haley. <laughs> he said, you have to mingle and interact with people mm. and then you can hopefully find that enlightenment, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, one of, one of the things I've, learned in, in as a Buddhist monk is that um, that I can't impose my solutions on other people and I, I, sometimes I feel like sort of my, my role as a monk that people expect me to tell them what to do mm. <laughs> I don't see my role like, as that at all yeah? but that's what they want, tell me the answer <laughs> right, so I was just trying to, well okay, they come and say what should I do, oh <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Haley, one, one of the reasons that we were interested to talk with you and you know, found that your, your presence at that Iftar meeting was interesting was because, of course, you're a poet. And that's awesome. <laughs> I think poets are great. I mean, I think po- poetry is like one of these, these kind of lost kind of arts. I mean, it takes a lot of guts just to say that you're a poet. I it think. does. It took me right. a long time. Like even now, I'm still. When people say you're a poet, I'm like, oh, really? Am I? But I'm learning to right. accept that. Since I've got a poetry book, well, right. maybe I Got can. You. I can call myself a poet. So you're you're you're, you're out of the proverbial closet. I am. And you are um, confessing in public that you actually <laughs> enjoy the sound and evocation of words arranged in artful ways. I do love yes. words. Yeah. Tell me, tell me about that. Tell me about okay, so I've been, I've always loved reading and um, not poetry, interestingly enough. I always, especially learning English, I always found poetry very difficult. And um, even when I was studying to be a teacher, I remember one day I was having a breakdown just before my first prac and I spoke to my lecturer and mm. said, what if the students ask me something about a poem and I don't know? <laughs> and I think he's the one and, and the book is dedicated to him and my father. Mm. And um, Neil, he said, you, sometimes the poet doesn't know themselves everything about the poem, so right. it's okay. Uh, he said, just help them find a way in. And that was a beautiful uh, sentence for me. And I thought, yes, there is always a way into a poem. Right. And um, even then, it took me another 10 years maybe before I started um, writing. That sentence helped me to read a lot more of it. I do remember at university loving T.S. Eliot. I, I just love the way um, we can use words to express very difficult to express emotions, and uh, but they need to be expressed, I think. Right. And I, I do think it's you know one of the oldest art forms. And so I started experimenting. Um, there was a time in my life, I, I think probably about the time that I wanted to go to a cave somewhere, right. when I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would just need need to write maybe, and right. started writing for a while. And then I read about Emily Dickinson, who right. apparently wrote f- beautiful poems, but she didn't share them. Only in one, po- one or two of her poems were published in yeah. her lifetime, and only a few people knew that she was a poet. And after right. she died, there were these trunks full of poems that that were found. And I right. thought, oh, you know, maybe that worked for her, although I don't really think it did because she wasn't very well mentally. Right. Um, and I started feeling a bit more comfortable sharing my poetry and I got very beautiful feedback from the people that I shared it with and people were actually interested if you talk to people they can argue with you but if you share poetry with them it's very hard for people to object to what you're saying they may not agree (laughs) with it but it's poetry is truth Um, and and I don't think a poet can actually lie, at least not in their work. Hang on. So, okay, so there's so many interesting <laughs> things in what you've just been saying, but a poet cannot lie just in their work. Uh, at least, especially in their work. Because well, when I said once that? poets yeah. can't lie, a few people said, yes, they can. I said, in their work, like in your writing a poem, you can't, you can't lie. The poetry, therefore, I think is, is truth, very much like... Um, 
oh, maybe this is dangerous for me to say. Gone, I'll, I'll, gone, I'll like yeah. the, the, you know, sacred books. I think poetry is often sacred because poets say what needs to be said yeah. in society because they observe. And a lot of the times um, they see, you know, I think... Uh, we see things a little bit differently maybe where sometimes yeah. even through my life I felt, felt often that I'm a little bit outside the periphery of life so life is happening and right. I know I, I'm also doing the usual things but that uh, I'm actually observing sometimes even myself mm. and as I, it's not because I want to write a poem necessarily right yeah so that's what I mean by you know, in my statement, poets uh, are, are truthful in their work and in, in what they're saying. And I, I think even there's a lot of stories about this through history right. where... It, well, it's always from, like, that, that thing you mentioned before about the, like that, that creative urge that comes and you just yeah. have to do something, yeah? Yes. And it's very different from, like, if you're at school and someone sets you an essay and says you have to write an essay about yeah. something, you know, <laughs> and you're, like, staring at the page, you know, there's something that it has to come out. Yeah. And and it would come out in one way or another, right? I mean, these days we that urge comes out. And we probably sit at a computer or pick up a notepad or something. But sometimes yeah. people might or whatever, you know, mm. sang it or use whatever medium that they have. Yeah. yeah, and some people go as far as to say that poets are a little bit like prophets. I've got friends who believe this and that they are given, uh, and that's how they explain inspiration. Right. You know, and. I can tell you that some of my poems are inspired. I do sometimes wake up with, with a poem. Right. It, I mean, it happened yesterday morning, you know, when really? I was thinking about uh, my parents and mm. how often we, we, we believe our parents. And sometimes our parents, you know, can actually make mistakes as well. And, I mean, of course, we all know that, but right. sometimes... <laughs> Um, their mis mistakes could actually be pretty big, you know. Right. <laughs> and, but it could be something that we've taken on uh, as, no, my parents won't do that. It was kind of like a, a poem about parents and things they do, mistakes they make. So it does happen, but a lot of my poems, actually much more of my poems yeah. are poems that I actually research, okay. um, think a lot about, so it doesn't okay. just come from the sky. Okay. I'm not saying, by the way, I think, you know, I I'm a big believer in that school right. of thought, but I do believe that everyone uh, has been created with something right. that they can do well or they have a raw talent in yeah. and that they need to maybe polish throughout their lives so that they can serve humanity. Yeah. Uh, and I just believe that my mind is poetry. I know that it's not painting because <laughs> I've tried that and I, yes, right. I'm not yeah. very good at it. I know it's not singing because I've also tried that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'm interested in that... that that the dichotomy between like the, the, a poem as some kind of inspiration and a poem as something which is planned. And I know that, that of course, different people work in different ways doing creative work, but also, like you say, the same person can do the same thing in those different ways. You know, and, you know I, I, for myself, I don't write poetry as such. I probably would like to, but, you know, you do various kinds of works and sometimes, sometimes it's like sort of meticulous research and yes. going over things and so on and other times it's just like something occurs to you yes and it just comes out yeah and it's different you can, I don't think one's better than the other they just they're different right I mean of course the inspired one is so much easier to write well it's easier yeah, that's for sure but yeah. it's not necessarily better I mean some of my inspired poems are very ordinary mm. and and I, I, I enjoy both of them. It is very but, lovely. But that's interesting, right? That yeah. some inspired poems can also be ordinary. Yes. Yeah. When a musician, I used to be a musician, so the same thing. You find that a lot. And I remember saying that somebody said was a songwriter. He said we lived as if we were our lives were lived so as to make ourselves um, worthy vehicles for songs to fall into. Oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's actually really beautiful. And I have some friends who will never write po poems if they are not inspired, okay. especially because 
after, you know, sometimes people get to know you and, and I get invited to respond to themes. Mm. I quite often get invited to respond to uh, artworks. Right. And that's something I actually quite enjoy doing because there is a similarity, a relationship between um, poetry and painting. Right. And I have friends who would never accept invitations like that because they think it's... Um, too contrived, but I like to take on that challenge. Sure. I, I like to not say no to anything that That's I get invited why you're here, to. Right? <laughs> I, I think saying yes. I mean, and anyway, it's something I learned from my grandmother. She said, "Say yes first. You can always change your mind later." Really? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's exactly what my teacher Arjun Brahm said to me as well. I asked him oh, the same question. Right. Yeah, he said, "I'll just say yes." And then <laughs> if it doesn't feel right, then you can always exactly. change your mind so later. Just say, yeah. Because sometimes. You want to say no. Right. Um, you know, it's a rainy morning. I could be in bed. It's right. Sunday, but it's just so much. Like the opportunities, uh, challenges are very exciting, and I feel this is how we grow. Right. Uh, having said that, there was one poem that took me three months to write. Right. It was a nightmare. I really thought, why did I say yes to this? Why? 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 Initially, you know, I guess that's the resistance, and I find that the more resistance I feel. Uh, the more important that poem ends up being, mm. which is quite interesting. Right. So the easy ones aren't necessarily the best <laughs> yeah. ones. Yeah. Not always. Not always. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it, 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 it strikes me that, that that kind of dichotomy also reflects a... I don't know about dichotomy, but that those two, two different aspects reflect also the way that we relate to our spiritual traditions. Right? Because, you, again, mm-hmm. you have those, those two kind yes. of sides that you have like, a, you have like an inner spiritual flame, mm-hmm. right? You have a, a, a knowing what's right and what's wrong and yeah. knowing what, what the meaning is, mm-hmm. is and how you want to live your life or not knowing those things, right? <laughs> Depending. And then you have a tradition within which you do those and yeah. then you have to negotiate and sometimes the tradition is supporting you to do that and sometimes it's not. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it probably shouldn't. Right. I mean, sometimes, sometimes we need to be a bit little less, like you know, follow your dreams, and a little bit more, like just <laughs> <laughs> uh, do your do 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 the spade work to begin with, you know. <laughs> so, so I think a tradition kind of moderates those things sometimes. You know, perhaps in, um, pulls up a few people, prompts yes. a few people who might not have <clears throat> thought of of a yeah. spiritual quest. At the same time, maybe some people maybe get. Sometimes you can go too far outside the tradition, and then you're like, that can be good, but it also can be a bit dangerous, right? And yeah. it can also end up being ungrounded and unmoored. Yeah. yeah. I, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine the other day, and we were talking about how sometimes even applying the tradition too much, you know, being stuck in the rules. Right. Uh, can be dangerous as well for spiritual growth and I know my younger sister is very much a victim of this and I'm trying to help her okay. <laughs> move out of it because um, you know I think flexibility is very important to, to, a, to, to a point um, and, and she says that if we are flexible with this, flexible with that right. then the religion goes <laughs> Right. Yes. so she's a little bit um, dare I say fanatical uh, just about the way and, and the care right. that she takes and you know for example oh it is the time to pray and you know and there are for a lot of people that works very well you know um, I, again going back to my teacher it was time to pray um, Maghrib and Maghrib time is very short mm. so you've only got about an hour and a half and he was talking and there were some people in the congregation who were get, getting fidgety mm. And he said, yes, I know that my great prayer, uh-huh. you know, is on. But this is also very important. Like he was trying to get us to understand that, mm. um, you know, you, you do need a degree of flexibility. And, uh-huh. and But there are some Muslims who would think, oh, no, you have, it's just black and white and uh-huh. that is it. Mm. But something interesting that I thought of uh, from what you've said is, You've got the flame right. that is that makes everything so much easier. Right. And then there are times when you don't feel that flame. In right. fact, you are tired. You know. Right. Or you're just, you know, you're not feeling that that faith as strongly. Right. And, and they're the times that I, I find things get a bit interesting, and they're the times I find how do I go about 
this part of the journey. Mm. You know, oh, for example, if you don't have the physical, like if you, if you don't have that strength to maybe fast or... Right. If you're tired and you don't feel like praying, yeah. you know, as human beings, these are the things that you feel. And when you have the flame, everything is okay. You, know? yeah. <laughs> you can conquer world. mountains, yeah. you know. But then I, I think it's interesting how and it's probably good that we don't feel that flame brightly because we could probably burn out very quickly. Well, it's a, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a risky path. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it can go either way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. sometimes, the, you know, the, in, in your kind of strong days, if you're feeling like really inspired and so on, then you can feel like the tradition's holding you back. Mm. And then on the low days, you're like, oh, thank goodness for, <laughs> thank goodness for the community <laughs> and the rituals and things that's going to hold me up. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you feel like um, as a poet... Like, like you know, you, okay, so you said, you said that uh, like a poet cannot lie. Interest as as in their poetry, which is interest, interesting, interesting kind of point of contemplation. Uh, I'm wondering whether, um, like, how that then impacts with the tradition. Like, whether you ever feel that there are things that you would like to say but you can't, right? Or that you know feelings that you wanted to express, or ways that you're going to do, and then you feel like. Uh, sort of, uh, is this going to work? How can I do this? And so on. I mean, I certainly feel this as a monk, you know. So yeah. there are certain things that, you know, I might write, but I might not, might not publish in public, or certain things that I might write and I think, oh, should I publish this or mm. whatever? And, you know, to, to me, I can always see that there's some kind of connection with, with, with our Dhamma and with our teaching and so on in, in some way, right? But the way that it's connected is not necessarily always going to be very obvious. Yeah, yeah. That, that is tricky territory. Um, I always, in every single word that I, well, I can speak, on, you know, on behalf of myself, as well as some poem, poets that I know well, that um, we, we, I say the truth about whatever the, that topic is, and right. I say what I feel always. Right. Right. And the good thing is, often it is um, along the lines of my faith. Um, right. I don't think I've said too many things that are against the religion, mm. but I know I've said lots of things that anger people. Mm. Yeah, especially guys. Like uh, a lot of guys don't <laughs> want their wives <laughs> to be friends with me <laughs> because they think that I. I, don't know, I mean, they have this issue. A lot of a lot of um, men. I'm not going to say Muslim men, but a lot of men still have an issue with feminism as if it's some kind of disease, right. you know, and and I don't even think I'm a feminist, to be honest, you know. I, I just, if you're talking about women's rights, does that make you a feminist? If, you, if you're talking about it as human rights, you know. Sure, why not? Yeah. <laughs> but I, mean, I don't what... think that makes you a feminist. Oh, you're just talking about human rights. Yeah. Wherever you see it, like I would talk for refugees, yeah. you know, stand up for them. I would stand up for children and I would stand up for women. I would say, well, you know, that's not really fair what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I, 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 I think... I think the, the the point about feminism as such is yes, you're just talking about equality and human rights, but there's also a special recognition that the role of women has been marginalised historically, and that we have an obligation to to address that or redress that. Yeah, to me, that, exactly. I, mean, I'm, I, I definitely consider myself a feminist, yeah. and that's 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 what it means to me. Yeah, like yeah. it's it's not a dirty word anymore, and yeah. and I actually think that with the newer generations, there is sometimes maybe even a move backwards, you know. But there's also a lot Sorry, of what, what ma- men who are feminists as well these days. Right. Uh, right. Like, for example, a lot of the uh, younger women that I'm speaking right. to are kind of... You remember we were talking about design going right. a little bit more traditional. Right. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with traditional structures. It's What, what is wrong, um, since I don't know how this topic came up, but since it did, what is wrong is that if we are expecting women to... Be modern as well as traditional. Okay. You know, I think that, and I know definitely I've suffered a lot from that because I grew up in a time where we were taught we can do anything we want to. Right. And, but we also wanted to have the clean house and the wonderful kids and, you mm-hmm. know, the 
good food and, you know, we thought we can do that. And, and the, <laughs> the sad thing is we did do it for a long time until we think, oh, like, that's, I can't do both of those things. Okay, if I'm working, mm. if I have a full-time job, mm. then maybe I need some help. <laughs> Right. For the home duties, because right. home duties are actually a full-time job already. Right. Or, oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. If, if only there was like, I don't know, I'm just trying to think if there was like another partner in the marriage who might be able to do some of the home duties. Right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know how we could organize that. But well, be, yes. I mean, like I, a... <laughs> I very often have said, I would love to have a traditional <laughs> wife myself. <laughs> I don't have a, a service now. I think you can like rent a wife. Rent a wife, yeah. hire a hubby. <laughs> yeah, so you can do that. So, but I think this is this has been one of the things that's happened with with modern feminism is it's been more like well, women are taking on everything, but the, perhaps the male roles haven't changed. Well, this is I think one of yeah. one of the um, shortcomings of feminism is that we've kind of forgotten our men. Okay, so what were what are men supposed to do yeah. as women are being empowered, mm. and our men are also <laughs> also important. Like we we've kind of said, all right, women have this have these rights, but um, how how like we haven't really thought of the full picture. Okay, so I, I know a lot of men who've said to me, I feel useless. Right. <laughs> you know. Right. Then yeah, it gets complicated, uh, right? It can get complicated. Yeah. And I suppose there isn't necessarily one way. But I guess what we can do is maybe be uh, have, try to strive for a life free of judgment you mm. know, and allow men and women within their families to make those decisions for themselves. I know I don't like it when people think, I'm oppressed. Oh, you poor thing. You have to right. wear that. Right. You know, um, you know. And there is judgment there. There's an assumption right. There's an as assumption. well that yeah. I'm being forced to or that I'm unhappy. Right. Yeah, so yeah. maybe a world less free of, you know, with less judgment and perhaps more support and love that people, there isn't one or two ways or a few ways. There's many ways right. where relationships have their own ways of making things work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that sounds like an eminently reasonable position, a world with a bit less judgment and a bit more love. That would be a very nice, <laughs> nice thing to yeah, head for. Yeah, uh, I was just looking around the um, uh, this centre we're in, the Donbank Don Museum, and they have some sort of historical anecdotes and a bit about uh, history of Sydney and so on. And one of the things in the room over there, it says religious divisions. And it talks about how Sydney society historically was marked by religious divisions, of course, meaning the Anglicans and the Catholics. Mm. And they were at each other's throats for basically the whole history. And, I mean, it, you see that and you think, you know, how ridiculous it is. I mean, it's like it's like Pepsi and Coke, right? <laughs> and, you know, what they said, like, it was in 2011 that the bishops, the Catholic Bishops Association said that if you want to have a mixed marriage between a Catholic and an Anglican. That's 2011, that's eight that's, years ago. That's just a few years ago. That you're still, you can, but you're still advised to consult with your bishop before you go ahead. Oh, wow. Right? So, amazing, yeah? Yeah, that yeah. is amazing. And, yeah, again, I'm just kind of thinking how how these... These and this, these days, of course, if we think about religious divisions, and for most people, that would be the last thing that you think about is the Anglicans and the Catholic. Maybe an older generation might, but yeah. younger people, that's you can't even tell the difference. No. Yeah. And uh, it, yeah, it seems to me that we we have a way of um, we have a way of manufacturing division and manufacturing crisis and manufacturing tensions. Um, based on some kind of weird difference, which is usually, um, you, like usually the, the difference is not the actual thing that matters. Like even even in that particular case, say the Catholics and the Anglicans, you know, might be considered to be like a religious conflict, but actually their religion is almost exactly the same. But there was like there was like class differences. You know, the Catholics were more working class in those days. You know, there's yeah. there's there's ethnic differences. They tended to come from different backgrounds and. So then, then all of these kind of tensions get mixed up in it, and it, and it kind of becomes um, sort of crystallised as if somehow this is a religious yeah. conflict. Yeah. yeah, it's sad that um, a lot of society is structured around division, okay. hatred, mm -hmm. and fear. And I think a lot of our structures, um, 
and especially politically, right. use that, you know, tap into that yeah. fear. And for some reason, a lot of people, especially people who don't maybe follow a path, and I don't necessarily mean a religious path, I just mean a path of love uh, towards, mm -hmm. you know, improving oneself and, you know, just loving and embracing everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people actually like not liking someone. <laughs> they, they like, like to have like an enemy. Yeah. You know, like a lot of people feel they need to right. have an enemy. You know, and, you know, like... Well, at least you're feeling something. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and even those neighbouring countries, for example, most neighbouring countries have a history of... You know, animosity. Right. Or, you know. I mean, it, sometimes it's justified, like, you know, with Australia and New Zealand, then it's not very understandable, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> Hurricane New Zealand. <laughs> yeah. It's much stronger politically. I like the way they stand oh up my, for things. They're doing yeah. some amazing things these yeah. days, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. What was the one that had in the, I just read in the news this morning that they're doing now? They're doing a. Um, I can't remember now. Oh, that's right. They're, they're basically very interesting that they're saying that um, they're, they're de-emphasizing GDP as a measure of success oh, yes. and moving towards kind of measuring happiness and welfare of, of the society and they're saying basically we're not so worried about economic growth. Oh, okay. uh, I mean, the economy is quite, it's quite solid, yes. but they're, they're sort of explicitly putting in other frameworks to, to talk about other ways of assessing how successful a society is. Oh, that's amazing, Isn't actually. Isn't that right? Yeah. yeah, that reminds me of um, Australia and multiculturalism, how when I was growing up, we were, you know, we were taught that you're welcome. So, so just to, yeah. f to clarify, where, where did you grow up? Oh, okay, so, I mean, this is, I was referring to my school days at Randwick. School Randwick days at girls Randwick? High school. Randwick Girls High School. Yeah, and we Shout out to all the, the any girl from <laughs> Randwick Girls High School. <laughs> Yeah, and these beautiful posters that said bilingual is beautiful and okay. because I could speak Turkish and I was learning English, I, I actually remember like, that feeling, I never forget. They go, wow, you know, I'm a 14, 15 year old feeling beautiful. Yeah. Oh, I'm bilingual, I'm beautiful. Yeah. And just, I mean, and I talk about it a little bit in my book as well about how my principal, you know, shook my dad's hand and said, you know, you're welcome here. And he said to me, if anyone gives you a hard time, because I was wearing hijab at school as well, right. let me know. And, but I actually felt, you know, my school is on my side. I live in Australia. Australian government is right. on my side. And right. I never, ever felt that I don't belong here, right. which made me feel that, uh, you know, when I had opportunities to work anywhere else around the world, I actually always chose to stay in Australia, especially initially because... I went to university for, for almost my first degree I did. Right. Um, I don't think I paid anything. Right. And then I wanted to pay it back. You know, I really felt this need and want to pay back, you know, to you know, Australian government because they looked after me. Right. You know? And I feel that a lot of the newer generation Muslims are not feeling that, you know, especially a lot of the boys from an Arabic speaking background. Because okay. uh, I do a little bit of work at schools as well um, about belonging, and you know, they're saying no one loves us, everyone hates us. Right. Uh, you know, like when you have it, there are some really, uh, of course, there are beautiful success stories, but the, um, despite all of that, but there are some really sad um, young men and women who feel that they don't belong. Right. And I do think that the government, the rhetoric has a lot to do with, with right. that. Right. And so, you know, since that opportunity came up, I did want to talk about that. And then we say, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, and then we say, oh, right. see those boys, because they're, you know, they, you know, they're course, acting yeah. like that. Yeah. Of course they will, because we haven't, we're not really doing, um, we're not raising them in a way right. where they feel that they belong. Yeah. So they're acting like they don't belong. Right. <laughs> And then they, being teenage boys, they go out and do something stupid and yeah, get in the fight or something, and then you're like... Yeah. And that's that's only the beginning. Right. You know? And unfortunately, once you lose them at that age, it's very hard to actually get back, get them back into healthy, happy yeah. uh, members of society who give back to society. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing, those, that just that difference that they can make, right? Yeah. It really is, you know, I mean, we think it's a government policy there, but it does actually um, 
get translated into real life and yeah, yeah. it affects people's decisions and actions yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think Australia in that way is definitely not going forward sadly uh, unfortunately yes uh, I think the I mean the, you know I, I was I'm a obviously born in Australia and from, from Perth, so I've had a different uh, experience. But I mean, I lived in Asia for quite a number of years. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different kind of thing when, when Australian living in Asia. Uh, in those days, when I went over, like in the early 90s, I, I really noticed a difference. When I first went to Thailand, basically everyone was like, yeah, Australia beauty, mate. You know, <laughs> and everyone loved Australia. And everyone, the main thing everyone said to me when they knew, found out I was Australian was, I can't remember his name now, but he was a boxer. There was this really famous boxer everyone loved in those days. And so they mentioned him. Or, and everyone had this kind of positive connotation about Australia. And then I uh, stayed in Thailand for a little while, came back to Australia for a few years, and then I went back to Asia in about 2000 and, about, uh, when was it? About 1999, went back to, us, to Asia. And everything really had kind of changed, you know, and people were talking to me, what's this, this, this Pauline Hansen woman, what's she doing? Uh. And I'm like, but you know, she's just this, you know, she's just this extremist, don't pay any attention. And they're saying, but, but yeah, the Prime Minister's actually adopting her policies. I'm like, yeah, well, okay, yeah, they are. And <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, really that, that conversation had shifted from Australia being seen as a, you know, welcoming, friendly yeah. country that, that everyone had a good feeling about yeah. to being a country that everyone was a bit... And I, I, you know, I, I, just my last visit to Singapore, in the Singapore airport, I mean, you can't imagine a more sort of civilised international environment than that and you know one guy's just coming up and just yelling at me and abusing me because I was from Australia oh, no. you know you, you, you people you're locking you're locking people up in concentration camps and you know the things you've done to the indigenous people and I'm like you're right <laughs> <laughs> I didn't personally do those things and I tried my best to, to not do them mm. but you know I mean obviously he was a bit you know not particularly balanced but yeah, mm. yeah. well it's sad that the countries that are actually taking in most refugees are actually developing countries, not the developed countries. Okay. <clears throat> and so, for example, Lebanon, Turkey, um, they're taking on huge numbers right. of refugees. Right. And uh, I, I think, of course, that's a totally different debate, but right. it's just um, does, doesn't really suit the spirit of Australia that I know. Uh, you know, Australia, I always saw as a welcoming place. Yeah. And personally, I haven't had any troubles growing up, you know, fitting in. You know, right. I've, I've always felt welcome, right. welcomed everywhere. Right. But that's because I felt, I think, that's something that you can't force upon people. It's got to come from inside. Right. And how does that come from inside, right. from their experiences? Right. Right. And I do know someone who's taught at different schools and, you know, and not just as a teacher, but I've worked in schools in different capacities as well. You know, I've, I've heard teachers say, oh, just keep them in the class, can't teach them anything. Uh -huh. You know, um, as long as that, you know, the, they're, they're sitting down, they're in class, you, you've, you're doing your job. Like I've had people say this kind of thing to me mm. or I've had people say, oh, you know, can't wait for them to drop out, you know. Really? Like, I mean, I don't know, if you're a teacher or if you're someone who is responsible for looking mm. after a young person. Yeah. I mean, like a doctor. A, doc a doctor can't refuse treatment of someone, okay, even if, let's say, they have an enemy and their yeah. enemy's child or whatever. Right. You know, like you're a teacher. It just goes against the philosophy of being a teacher. Course, and yeah. for an Australian teacher to, to be able to say these things, uh, openly, you know, or for an Australian, for example, John Howard, you know, until John Howard, you know, spoke such racist remarks, like I hadn't heard of in my time, of mm. course, I know that a hundred years ago, maybe even 70 years ago, you know, I know about the white Australia policy, but you know, we, I, you know, we were starting to change and we were really improving. Sure. I do think that that is better for the economy of the of country. Course, yeah. You know, it's better for the happiness of the country, yeah. the success of the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you've got, you know, people who are actually welcomed right. and, when, and people who are here, if they are actually 
felt that they are welcomed. Yeah, yeah. You know, because, I mean, refugees, migrants, they bring a whole heap of skills to Australia. Of course, yeah. You know, uh, and there are jobs that, you know, for example, my parents who were teachers in Turkey, they worked in factories in right. Australia. Right. Uh, you know, they were brought because th there was um, a demand for workers. You know, there, there weren't enough Australians right. willing to work in factories. So, and the thing about culture is that that the the vitality and creativity and innovation and energy in a culture always comes from the from the ground up. Yeah. It comes from people who don't have anything, who who want to work to try to get something. It doesn't come from the people who already have everything. They're lazy yeah. and complacent and just yeah. keep doing the same thing they've always done. That's so true. When I, I, I was travelling in Europe a few years ago, and I travelled from caught the plane from uh, Warsaw to Munich, and it was kind of really striking. You know, when you're in Warsaw, basically everyone's white, right? <laughs> I mean, Poland's still a very kind of, you know, relatively speaking, very monocultural country, and everyone is the same, you know, culturally, religiously. I mean, I'm sure they have differences within the country, but relatively speaking, and then you, you know, you arrived at Munich airport, and it's just shocking, the difference, <laughs> right? It's everyone, everywhere you look, it's just different people wearing different clothes from different backgrounds. And you see what a richer place it is, and you see this is where energy is coming from, this is where creativity is coming from, this is where innovation is coming from, you know? yeah, and it's absolutely. always been like that, you meet, new people meet and mix and learn from each other, try out new ideas, different things, yeah. and uh, it seems, yeah, it's, it's so kind of, um, we're so kind of shooting ourselves in the foot in many ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have a beautiful Turkish saying, uh, the one who reads a lot knows a lot, but the one who travels mm. It knows a lot more, you okay. know, because you, you know, you know, like if you meet so many different people, like if you're just always hanging out, for example, Australians in Turkey, mm. um, they actually have their own um, clubs that they right, yeah, socialize like in, yeah. 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 And, um, and and it's the same for a lot of right. a, a lot of cultural groups, you know, if they are expatriates, they tend to gather, right. you know, and kind of. You know, I, I suppose it goes back to that fear of stepping outside and right. and really getting to know. And, and I, that's why I was so excited to meet you guys. I thought, oh, wow, that, I have actually... And I feel really embarrassed that I actually haven't gone out of my way previously to <laughs> meet a Buddhist person. <laughs> I mean, I, I do have... Well, don't take me as yeah. <laughs> like a, a, a representative sample of Buddhist people, OK? No, of course not. But, I mean, the beautiful <laughs> thing is I do have... <laughs> I, I do have Buddhist friends, but th that's another thing. I, I was, sometimes we are afraid to, we're a bit shy maybe to ask questions. And you know, I liked right, our conversation right. where we, we were saying, like, we shouldn't be shy because that's how we know. Yeah. You know we know by asking and otherwise you're just going to be the same person. Yeah. You know, your worldview isn't going to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, yeah. you're just going, I mean, you could read up about it, but yeah. it's not the same as someone who's actually yeah. living and practicing it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry, sorry. That's like a timer for what? We have to be finished, or? No, minutes. Forty minutes. We have to be finished. Okay. Uh, hey, I was going to ask you a, a, a just a kind of a tan tangentially related thing. And one of the things I also noticed in that the thing about the religious divisions in Australia is that the bishop, like a hundred years ago, was railing against um, the encroaching of secularism. <laughs> right? Which again, we kind of think of as a kind of a modern thing, but he's like a hundred year old bishop who's saying, oh, there's a secularization of things. And I mean, I, yeah, but it's kind of, it's kind of funny when you meet people who are in that role. I mean, I, I grew up as a Catholic, right? Yes. So in that kind of role, sort of a bishop is like someone who's like really high and you never talk to them. Yeah. And they probably yeah. don't really like that, but that's how, that's how you think. Yeah. And I remember, I remember, I did a. There was a series of hearings a number of years ago on same-sex marriage in Australia, and the Buddhist community um, represented in support of same-sex marriage, as did the Australian Hindu Council and uh, some of the Jewish groups and a few of the other groups. Other groups were opposing it. And as you know, in in Sydney specifically. The Christian organisations are very cons highly conservative, right? yeah. so the actual Christian leadership of both the Catholics and Anglicans in Sydney is much more conservative than the general Christian constituency. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so they both were strongly opposing same-sex marriage and these kinds of things. But there was one kind of remark where one of the bishops was like, you know, we we know that we we know that no one's going to listen to us anymore. Aww. You know, it's like you know, it's like this feeling that they, they they think they should have some kind of moral authority, yeah. but they recognize the fact that they're not really going to mm. say things. Yeah. You know, I mean, I guess they have to represent what their religious stance is. You know, I suppose they're chosen. And we we talked a little bit about this last time as well. You know, you have a responsibility sure. to your faith. and But then you might have your own opinion. <laughs> right. You know, so I believe that it's there's nothing wrong to say this is my opinion, my personal opinion. Sure, yeah. Of but course. this is what my religious standing is. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, and I guess that goes back to your one of your previous questions uh, as well. That sometimes there is uh, maybe there are things that you still haven't understood properly in, in your faith. And, right. But that doesn't mean exactly, yeah, you know you yeah. can say well. That's just wrong about my religion. You know, I do know that a lot of people, especially for popularity, right. you know, and uh, say things like, uh, you know, that's that's not in my religion. But if something is in your religion, mm. you, you can't really say that's not in my religion. You could right. say it's my opinion, right? You know, because yeah. I, I also to do. To, but, but, yeah. but to learn to, to be able to, to to make that clear distinction. Yes. Is, again, something I find a lot within the Buddhist tradition. Like, it's okay if you don't agree with something that's a Buddhist idea. Like people ask me about things like rebirth and these kinds of things. I'm like, if you don't believe in rebirth, that's all right. You know, but it's what the Buddha taught. Yeah, exactly. And it doesn't mean that there isn't anything else about Buddhism that you can practice. For example, you know, I heard, this was a few years back, I heard someone say uh, in public, like in a gathering, and mind you, sometimes you, you... feel it's the right time to say something or sometimes you feel maybe I shouldn't say anything. It's not always a opportun- a right. good opportunity right. to talk about you know, because it's you know, it's someone else's opinion. Right. Okay, and it's not really my job to always try to um, be the solicitor for my faith, you know. Right. But at yeah. times I do speak up. For example, this lady was saying there's no hijab in Islam. Mm. You know, she said there's no place there's no place for hijab in Islam. Right. That's just a cultural thing. Right. And then I said, if there's no place for hijab in Islam, then how come there are millions of Muslim men who wear the hijab? Right. I said it's okay for you to say you're, you don't be, you don't believe in it right. or you don't want to wear it. That's perfectly okay. Like, I wouldn't have an issue with that. Okay, um, two, we are four girls and two of my sisters don't wear the hijab. Right. You know, like I don't have a problem with someone not wearing it. But when someone says it's not in the religion, then I do feel that I need to speak out and say, right. well, you know, that, that, that's your opinion. But right. there, there is something in the hijab. You yeah, know, yeah. It's a long tradition. And yes, I understand that there are other cultural right. interpretations. Uh, yeah, and um, another one that I heard was, oh, five prayers in Islam. Who can do that? You know, that's right. just for the, you know, for, for the, the desert days, you know. All right, All right. And then... I said, and, I, and that was another situation where I'd say, well, actually, there are a lot of people who, you know, who do still right. pray five times a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's beautiful, you know, if and they the, can. The busier your day is, the more you appreciate it. And actually, yeah. there have been so many scientific studies about how you stop what you're doing uh, for a few minutes. Of course, yeah. And, you know, like I even wrote on my table, uh, stop and drop, you know, yeah. just stop it stop because <laughs> it's, never, it's just not going to stop until you make a conscious effort right. to stop and drop, you know. And, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I often thought that would be a good thing to introduce into Buddhism as well, you know, five minutes meditation a day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, five times a day, five minutes meditation. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I love this poster. There's 5.1 ways to be a Muslim. Mm. And however many Buddhists there are, I'm sure there are that many ways to be a Buddhist. Right. You know, there there isn't, you know, just because I think you can't do all aspects of your faith, doesn't mean you have to diss the whole thing, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean this it comes, it comes back, you know, back to that, that, that sort of topic of secularism, which I was kind of broaching, mm-hmm. and I think... Um, 
uh, I mean, on the one hand, I'm, I'm, you know, from someone from a religious background, then you feel, uh, you know, it's kind of conventional to to rail at secularists and things like that. But at the same time, there's a lot which I think secular society has offered and which has developed, which is really valuable. And but also, I think that the that the the real kind of meaning of secularism actually should be more about an inclusivity rather than yes. rather than kind of defining it so right. rather than defining it as you know we endorse a sort of materialistic rationalistic universe yes. and any any discussion beyond that is yes. simply irrational and ridiculous yes so I mean, I, and I see what the, the Buddha was doing. I mean, okay, so, so the Buddha came along around... Two, uh, sorry, I'll just drop a little bit of historical scholarship, okay? The Buddha was like about 2,500 years ago, about 500 BC. And when in his teaching, then he sort of moved away from what was it then the common Brahmanical framework, which involved a lot of rituals, a lot of priests and so on. And he was more like, well, it's about how you live and it's about being mindful and doing the right thing. And about 150 years after the Buddha, there was the King Ashoka, and he uh, was a Buddhist king, and he was the first king who's really known personally throughout India, right? because he wrote these edicts, which we still have today, and they're the oldest writing from India. And the, but what's interesting about Ashoka's writings is that they hardly mention Buddhism at all, mm -hmm. and he only talks about Dharma. Right, yeah. so this is your your dharma, and this is what what is the dharma, what is good, and what is the dharma, what is being good, being generous, being kind, helping each other, and so on, and so he put, he put all of these kinds of things, but but to me that's that's secularizing. Like he was a secularist king in the sense that he was presenting a set of values yeah. which could be understood and implemented by anyone regardless of their faith, you know. And, yes. his, and he drew them, he drew those values from his personal yes. faith, but he didn't apply them in a way that sort of made that faith contingent on people. Yes. And, you know, to yes. me that's that's a great example of how yes. secularization should if be If I done. can interrupt you there. Please, yeah. Yes. I think that uh, what many people, you know, as, as a society, you know, we want to have an enemy, you know, we work on fear a lot of the time, but we also make this mistake of having an either-or approach to yeah. a lot of things. And I know that as someone who has still very close connections to my parents' homeland, Turkey, um, because there was Ataturk who brought um, a secular government. Um, he, okay. So the Ottoman Empire ended, and then the Turkish Republic was formed, and Ataturk introduced a lot of reforms to modernize Turkey. Okay. So, and what year are we talking about? This is about, 1923, okay. the Turkish okay. Republic was formed. And um, I, I think it was great, like he, you know, moved on with the times. Right. Now, in Turkey, what's happened is you are, if you are a secular person, right. you believe in Ataturk's principles and values. Right. Although Ataturk himself never said religion is bad, right. a lot of these people don't practice religion, right. um, you know, Islam. But not only do they, and I'm saying a lot of them because not all of them, but majority of them yeah. feel that um, I'm a secularist, I'm an Ataturkist, I'm not one of these okay. um you know, Muslims, you know, right. fanatic Muslims. And a lot of the Muslims believe we are we are the Muslim group, you know, we're religious people. Right. So it's, you're in Turkey, a lot of people are either religious or secular. Right. Right. And this is one of my missions in Turkey. Whenever I go there, I say, you can actually be both. You could, you know, why can't we, and I guess this is a message maybe that I, I could end with, like, why can't we be... Um, you know, why can't we be a little bit away from these either or, these black and white, these yeah, binaries, yeah, yeah. you know? For example, I can practice some of the Buddha in my daily practice, mm. and I can, you know, and I can still be a Muslim. If I find something beautiful in the gospel, I can apply that in my life. That's mm. not going to make me... I know there would be some people who think, oh, my God, you know, mm. like that shouldn't scare us. Mm. You know, if it's something that warms my heart, mm. you know, in, in Judaism, you know, I, I can actually apply that mm. and, and teach that and practice that. And it doesn't make me less of a Muslim. I think it makes me more of a Muslim. Mm. Mm. Uh, and I can be secular. I do believe that some of the things Ataturk did were fantastic. And I do believe, but if I say some of the things he did were not so fantastic, that doesn't make me, that shouldn't make me anti Turkish. You know? <laughs> and if I say some of the Muslims really have lost the plot, that shouldn't make me less Muslim because they have. 
you know, mm. and God help me and help me see the light if I have said anything or yeah. if I see things in a way that maybe are not the best for us and humanity. I hope I see the light better. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you, thank you so much for that. I, I was reminded when you were saying that, I was reminded when I was a number of years ago in Malaysia and uh, one of my mentors at the time was a very famous monk called Kesri Damananda and uh, he told me a story where he'd been to an interfaith event like he you know he, he, as part of the, he as a leader of the buddhist community in in malaysia then you know for for a whole kind of generation he had been involved in sort of promoting harmony and building relationships there anyway so he was invited to an interfaith yeah. conference and gave a talk about the Buddha and about his values and his teachings. And then afterwards he said that the, the Muslim scholars came up to him and they said, that was so amazing. He said, they were saying, I wonder if we can, I wonder if we can get the Buddha as one of our prophets. I wonder, if that's, <laughs> I, wonder if that's gonna, I wonder if we can kind of wiggle him in there as a prophet. Well, I think he was one of our prophets, to be honest. <laughs> okay, excellent. And we just heard before, poets can't lie. Yeah. <laughs> I, look, we're drawing near the end and I am realising to my chagrin that we haven't heard you read a poem yet. There, was, we... there was no need for it. Can, <laughs> can, 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 I, can I ask you to read one of your poems? Oh, my gosh. That's so hard. <laughs> only, How should I choose uh, then? Uh, only, only if it's hard. Because uh, yeah. if it's easy, then it won't be worthwhile. A hard one. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes easy is worthwhile. <laughs> Okay, so do you know what I'll do? I'll just do it like this. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Five plus one. The rainbow smiles from miles ahead as light and darkness hide her hues. Outside the prism there is turquoise, there is scarlet and dusty rose. It is a lie there are 12 musical notes. Pulse and beat throb stronger than that. Vibrations reverberate as sounds resonate and silence screams the loudest. It is a lie they taught us about time, past, future, present, when everything is present all the time, continuous, timeless, perfect. It is how we recognize our true love from a sense that speaks from inside. The open sea begins with the estuary where it holds secrets before it lets them free. It is the same with our senses just the beginning of defining the mystery. Did anyone see Solomon's army of jinn? Did anyone hear him talking to, to birds? How did the Hoopi find Sheba's queen? How did her throne find Solomon's door? The mind defies realities of which the heart is sure, carried by fairies that reside in air. Trickling down your cheek, it could be a tear, or this poem that wakes you up at three. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Beautiful. That, that was a that was thank you God. That was a good um, choice that He made for us. Like, like, I, I, I can't even begin to say lucky because obviously it wasn't. <laughs> it yeah. wasn't us. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. I really enjoyed this thank conversation. Thank you so much. And Annie. thank you to all the people who've put in the effort. And thanks for yes. inviting me. I yes. hope that we have a long-lasting friendship. Absolutely. And uh, please keep writing poetry. Keep, please keep being inspired and keep spreading your light around the community here in Thank Sydney. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay.